disclose how far back our friendship goes. But it goes back to the period when Atish Javan was and Atish Javan was born. This is truly my matrix. I look around and feel overwhelmed. This was the door leading to my office. Two, two girls and yours truly. And we three formed the, the core of research in this institute. I was reading about the meeting that was held here last night when Mr. Kamal uh, Karzai uh, addressed uh, a select audience here. Yeah. And the reporting of that event in, in most newspapers said he delivered this talk at a think tank. I wish they had said at the premier think tank of Pakistan. This is the first and still the very best think tank of Pakistan. Seventy years. Seventy years. So this is where I, as I always feel proud of saying, this is where I learned my ropes. Under the aegis of Masuma's father, the illustrious Kaja Sarwar Hassan. He was a hard ass master. Uh, and since he was one of the finest specimens of that Ganga Germany Tajik which we are so proud of. So he was always soft on the two colleagues of mine, 
but came down hard whenever I made the slightest mistake. But that mentoring helped me a lot. And I feel proud in confessing that the training I had had under him helped me throughout my diplomatic career of 36 years. Two days ago, I was at a lunch with one of my old colleagues, Zubaydah Mustafa, who is one of, by one of the agencies of United Nations about the happiness quantum of people in various countries of the world. And I said, Pakistan, surprisingly, has been placed at number 75 out of a list of 180 countries. And in happiness, according to the report of that survey, Pakistan figures 58 places higher than India. It, it, it has 33 places higher than China. It is, to cut it short, the happiest country in the region. And Zubaydah so said, I am not prepared to accept this. It can't be true. We Pakistanis cannot be the happiest people in the world. How, how could it be possible? And well and truly, she has written a column which you must have read in this morning's dawn, disputing the findings of, of that survey. And I said to Zubaydah, she is an old friend, I said, Zubaydah, all right, you may not be prepared to accept that we Pakistanis are the happiest people in the region. But accept this fact that we Pakistanis are the most vocal people in the region. I live in a free country. I live in a very liberal country. But I can tell you, the freedom of speech, the freedom of expression, that we Pakistanis are blessed with. Out of smarts, many of the Western countries, not to mention countries in our region and countries in the Arab world, which is the topic of my discourse this afternoon. Let me pause here a bit and explain my style of discourse. I'm not in the habit of, of politicians all over the world who take their audience for granted. I value the intelligence of my audience and therefore always speak with this innate expectations that my discussion, my speech would sow enough seeds in their minds to prompt them to quiz my brains, to ask me questions. And that is what I would expect from this enlightened and well-informed audience this afternoon. The Arab world is in turmoil, and that saying so would be an understatement. It has been in turmoil for, for a very long time. We Pakistanis know what crisis is. In fact, Rushbrook Williams, and that book must be available on, on the shelves here. Rushbrook Williams wrote this wonderful book about Pakistan from crisis to crisis. But because we have this facility of debating our problems freely, because we can thrash our problems threadbare, irrespective of the nature of the problem, therefore we plot from crisis to crisis, somehow surviving, and somehow managing to maintain our national identity of what I said in the beginning of being a very vocal, a 
very outspoken, a very open society. Contrast this to the Arab world. And I, as, as Masuma said in the introduction, have spent exactly one-fourth of my entire diplomatic career, one-third actually, of my diplomatic career in the Arab world. I can challenge you to name one Arab country right from Morocco down to, to Bahrain and Oman, where the people have this facility. I'm not saying right, we have this right, this facility of expressing themselves openly. I'll, I'll narrate a very interesting episode to you. I was a master in, in Kuwait for more than five years. And when I left that country, after a few years, I went back for a visit. There are two English newspapers coming out of Kuwait. They are permitted to print all the news which, as they see, is fit to print. But when it comes to expressing opinion, well, they have to make sure that they are treading gingerly on the ground underneath their feet. So the owner and chief editor of one of the um, one of these two newspapers came to me and he said, Ambassador. You have been writing for so many newspapers in Pakistan and elsewhere in the world. Why don't you write for my paper too? And I said, my friend, your paper will not last 24 hours if you printed one of my columns. He said, no, 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 no you are exaggerating. I said, no, oh, fine. By coincidence, I had written for dawn that very day about the then recently held parliamentary elections in Kuwait. So I pulled out that, that uh, opinion piece of mine and I gave it to my friend. I said, I know your English is limited, but your son is England, is England educated. Give it to him, ask him to read it, and I'll phone you tomorrow morning to find out what his opinion is. Next morning when I phoned him, he said, Karamatullah, Wallahi, you were right. My son said, Father, if you printed this column in, in, in your newspaper, both of us will be in jail and our, our paper will go out of print. The Arab world has a jumble of problems. I say it is an aggression of problems which have been allowed, allowed to go unattended over a very long period of time. But to understand the Arab situation today, you will excuse me for taking you down the road of history. Because unless you have a good inkling of the history of the Arab world of the past exactly 100 years. I won't take you too far long. I will take you back to exactly 100 years. In order for you to understand the Arab problem, or rather Arab problems, in their right perspective. I have reduced the list of the major challenges of the Arab world to just three. And the acronym of these three somehow works out to OIL. O I L. The first problem is oil of the Arab world. The second is Israel. The third is Arab leaders. I'll leave the A of the Arab out. 
I simply use leaders. Oil is right leaders, it is reduced down to the acronym of OIL. Oil was discovered first in the Middle East, in the region around the Gulf, in 1913, when the first oil well was struck at masjid e Suleiman in Iran. After that, a year or two later, it was discovered outside Kirkuk in Iraq. In Saudi Arabia, it took slightly longer. Why did it take longer? Because on the Arabian Peninsula, two major tribes were fighting out for political supremacy, al Saud and al Rashid. Abdul Aziz ibn Saud had captured Riyadh, which has since become capital of Saudi Arabia, in 1903. It took him another 20 years before he could put his stamp of authority over Hijaz. The Saudi ruling family, as you might know, is from the desert of Najat. In fact, it might be of interest to you to know that all the ruling families of the Gulf Kingdoms are from Najat. So it took Abdul Aziz another 20 years to capture Hijaz. These 20 years were hard for those who knew that there was oil under the sands of Arabia. <coughs> Finally, the American oil prospecting rights were rewarded by King Abdul Aziz ibn Saud to four American companies in 1933, one year after he had proclaimed the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. But then war intervened. So American oil companies could not start looking, digging for oil in Saudi Arabia until <coughs> 1945. At the fag end of the war, I'm, I'm, I'm giving you this perspective in order to enable you to put things in there. There was this famous meeting, Masuma might know about it, on board an American destroyer in the Gulf of Suez in February 1945, when an ailing President Franklin Delano Roosevelt traveled down after the Yalta conference to have a meeting with King Abdul Aziz on board an American destroyer. I don't know if any of you have read about that meeting, but I'll advise you to read about it. It's a fascinating story. Abdul Aziz reached the port of Jeddah with an, a retinue of 200 including some of his wives. And the American admiral commanding the flotilla was aghast. He said, Your Majesty, the ladies should not board my, my ships because these sailors have been away from their homes for years. I wouldn't, I wouldn't run the risk of letting the ladies on board. So the ladies were left out. Abdul Aziz was six foot six. He was a very tall man. So there was no way he could sleep in, in any of the cabins on the destroyer. So they pitched a tent on the deck of the ship. But Abdul Aziz succeeded in getting his goats on board. He refused to eat the meat that had been in the freezers of the, uh, of the destroyer for so long. So the goats were allowed. And at that meeting, the agreement was reached between FDR and King Abdul Aziz for Saudis to allow Americans to dig for oil in Saudi Arabia. 
in return for the guarantee that the Saudi Ali Saud would be allowed to rule over Saudi Arabia. Both parties, I must say, have lived up to that pledge. That cooperation reached has not been tinkered with to date. And uh, you will find many pundits speculating about this or that likely development in American-Saudi relations. I can tell you on the basis of my limited experience and reading of, of, of the situation and the region that that is not going to happen anytime soon. This is one of the most formidable alliances in the world which has stood the test of time, time and again, and is unlikely to be fragile anytime soon. I'll leave it at that, but let me just add a footnote here because that is relevant to what I'm going to say next. At that meeting, King Abdul Aziz told FDR very clearly, categorically, that he was not in favor of letting a Jewish state be formed on the land of Palestine. And FDR assured him that as long as he was president, this would not happen. But FDR did not live long after that. He died in April 1945, and the men succeeded him and proved to be a friend of Israel. That's another story. So I now come to the next point, which is Israel. To understand why Israel, the state, the Jewish state, was established where it has been for nearly 70 years now. Yes, it will be. It will be 70 years in, in, in two months' time in May. You must have heard about this infamous declaration called Balfour Declaration. Yeah. They celebrated the 100th anniversary of Balfour Declaration in November last year. The Prime Minister of Israel, Benjamin Netanyahu, was invited by Theresa May, the current Prime Minister of Britain, who said <clears throat> that Britain was proud of the role it had played in the establishment of Israel. What was this Balfour Declaration? Arthur James Balfour was the Foreign Secretary of Britain in 1917 in the cabinet of Lloyd George. But before I, I, I dilate upon Balfour Declaration, let me take, uh, remind you about another agreement, which is known in the history books as sykes pico Agreement. Mark Sykes was a British diplomat, and his French counterpart was called Francois-Georges Pico. They met during the ongoing World War One, World War One had started in 1914, and their meeting took place in early 1916. The meeting was about the spoils of war, the spoils of the Ottoman Empire, which was about to disintegrate. So they decided that they would divide the Ottoman possessions between themselves. A work, a remarkable work of what I call political cartography was done in that meeting. An agreement was reached in March 1916 between Sykes and Pico, dividing the Arab possessions of the Ottoman Empire between the French and the British. They drew lines in colored pencils on the map of the Middle East. <coughs> Those areas which had been marked with a blue pencil were to be given to the French. The areas marked 
in red pencil but who belonged to Great Britain. But there were some areas which were marked with a brown pencil. Those areas were disputed. And the most disputed area was the land of Palestine, which was coveted both by the French and by the Brits. Britain more than France because of proximity of Palestine to the Suez Canal. And Suez Canal was the lifeline of the British Empire because that allowed passage to the crown in the British, to the jewel in the British crown, India. Finally, it was decided that Palestine would be put under an international mandate. Mind you, this was two years before the war ended in 1918. This agreement was reached between the then two major imperialist powers two years before the war ended. There was in the British cabinet in those days only one Jewish cabinet minister. His name was Herbert Samuel. Herbert Samuel did not have an important portfolio. He was Minister of Health, but he was Jewish, and he was a great friend of Lord Walter Rothschild, who was the head of the Jewish organization in Britain. He, so Mark Sykes informed Herbert Samuel of the understanding reached between him and his French counterpart. And Samuel immediately alerted the Zionist organization there and they started making inroads into the British government. To cut a long story short, the end result of their effort was the November 1917 Balfour Declaration. I'm not in the habit of writing down my speeches. I learned my lesson after taking, after, after seeing what end my writings came to in the hands of Pakistani politicians. I've stopped writing since then. But this Balfour Declaration, there are only 67 words of this declaration, which is perhaps the most epochal event in the modern history of mankind. Just 64 letters, words. Let me read it out to you. His Majesty's government view with favor the establishment in Palestine of a national home for the Jewish people and will use their best endeavor to facilitate the achievement of this object. It being clearly understood that nothing shall be done which may prejudice the civil and religious rights of existing non-Jewish communities in Palestine. Let me stop here for a moment and try to pick your intelligence. What is missing here? They did not use the proper name for Palestinians. No, yes, that is one of the points. But they never used the term political rights of the people. All that they said is the civil and religious rights of the non-Jewish people. The Palestinians were not even named as Palestinians. But then, interestingly, right after this, it's non-Jewish communities in Palestine, all the rights and political status, now they are talking of political status enjoyed by Jews in any other country. Just 67 words. The fallout 
of this Balfour Declaration. Mind you, Great Britain, the premier imperialist power of the day, was promising to give away the land they, that did not belong to them and giving it away to a people who did not belong to that land. And they were taking away the political right, the liberties of a people who had been living in Palestine for millennia. The Philistines have been named in in Bible, in the Old Testament, it talks, the Old Testament talks of the Philistine. But here, at the dawn of the 20th century, the then crime in imperialist power arrogated to itself the right to give away for perpetuity the rights and liberties and freedoms of the people who had been inhabitants, the original inhabitants, the natives of that land for as far as human history has been reported. In 1919, after the end of the war, the League of Nations, which was the precursor to our United Nations, decided to allocate the land of Palestine to Britain as a mandated territory. It was given to Britain in trust that Palestine will be governed in accordance with the rights of the people living there. The Jewish influx started right after Britain took over as the mandating power. In 1919, there were only 3% Jews in the total population of Palestine. By 1937, the Jewish population, the Jewish presence in the overall population had gone up to 36%. And in 1948, as you all know, the Jewish state of Israel was born. Why? Why did they feel the need to create a Jewish state right in the heart of the Arab world? Mainly to protect their interests. Boy, they had to make sure a, an agreement had been reached between the United States and Saudi Arabia. But then there were so many other countries. So they had to make sure that those who ruled over these lands would never deviate from the lines that had been drawn for them. And what I said in the beginning, the people living from Morocco down to Oman, have no rights to question or debate the policies decided by their rulers. Democracy is too visible by its absence in the Arab lands. All this political geography had been done very neatly very carefully, very meticulously, and they did not expect any, any bumps in the road that had been paved. But then bumps did come in. The first bump came in 1973. The first oil embargo. And that oil embargo, interestingly, was imposed by the country, at the behest of the country which had promised the United States that the supply of oil will always be available for, for the Western world. King Faisal was the proponent of this oil embargo, 1973. And it, it created a situation which had not been foreseen by any planner 
in the, in the Western world. The oil prices <clears throat> quadrupled overnight. Do you know what, what price a barrel of oil was fetching in 1973? $3.50. That was, that was the going price of a barrel of oil. It quadrupled overnight and it jumped subsequently. Henry Kissinger was the Secretary of State. He was the Secretary of State to President Richard Nixon. Faisal had, had taken this initiative of imposing an oil embargo on the West in order to punish West for its unbridled support to Israel in the 1973 Arab-Israeli war. I, I'm not going into those details. You all you know all about that. And Faisal, incidentally, had been sent by his father when he was young to United Nations General Assembly in 1947 to that session of United Nations which ultimately voted in favor of dividing the land of Palestine between the Jews and the Arabs. So Faisal had this thing at the back of his mind that Arabs had been betrayed. I don't have time to, to relate other incidents of betrayal of the Arabs, I, I'll be very happy to answer any any questions relating to that. But let me just give you one example. All of you have heard about Lawrence of Arabia. There was also a female version of Lawrence of Arabia. I don't know if if, if, if uh, most of you have heard about that. This was Gertrude Bell, who is buried in the compound of British Embassy in, in Bata. I went to pay my respects to her grave when I was ambassador in, in Iraq. Not because uh, I admired what she had done, but simply wanted to pay homage to a lady who had proved the equal of man. She was as influential, as effective, I mean, perhaps more effective than Lawrence Farabia. Gertrude Bell, was an unofficial advisor to King Faisal, the first king of Iraq. And how was Faisal appointed king of Iraq? Iraq, that is an interesting episode, episode too. Masuma is not going to like it because I'm, 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 I'm getting too much into the details. But these are, these are episodes which you, you have to know in order to understand what afflicts what bedevils the Arabs today. Sharif Hussain of Makkah, who was the, the, the governor of Hejaz on behalf of the Ottomans, had been promised by Lawrence of Arabia that when all the lands, the Arab lands occupied by the Ottomans were vacated from Ottoman possession, they will be given away to his sons as countries to rule over. Faisal was promised the kingdom of Syria. And mind you, I'll come to Syria in a moment. Syria at that time comprised of today's Syria, Lebanon, Palestine, and also a part of what is today northern Iraq. All these lands were great Syria. So as the Ottomans were defeated and war came to an end, Faisal triumphantly rode into Damascus and proclaimed himself king of Syria. He had been promised that land. Six weeks later, the, the French forces walked into, into Damascus and drove out Faisal. So to compensate Faisal for the loss of Syria, the British put him in on the head of the Iraqis as the first king of the newly carved kingdom of Iraq. And the other son of Sharif Hussain was, was given an artificially created country called Transjordan which subsequently, after 1948, became Georgia. 
So betrayals have been there often, and uh, the list is long. Uh, I don't have time to dive into upon all of these. In 1919, when, when Britain was awarded the, the mandate of Palestine, as I said, they, it was on the understanding that the rights and liberties of the Palestinian, of the native population, will be well protected. But with the creation of, of Israel, that came to an end. And the saga of the tragedy of the Palestinian goes on. The most pitiable victims of all the intrigues that have been going on in the Arab world are the Palestinians. They never had any protection from those who had initially promised to shelter over them. But the Arab countries for a while continued to provide succor and sustenance to Palestinian refugees. But that too came to an end after the Gulf War, after the first Gulf War. When Palestinians were driven out of Kuwait, for instance, where they had been living for generations and were underpinning the administration of the country, they were driven out because Yasser Arafat had made the Himalayan blunder of siding with Saddam Hussein when he invaded and occupied Kuwait. Over the period of years, and particularly over the last few years, Palestinians have lost the patrons of the Saudis, who are no longer providing them any, any economic assistance. They have also lost the patronage uh, of Egypt. <coughs> So what, was, what I was studying about, about Henry Kissinger was that at the peak of the oil embargo of 1973, Kissinger came up with his doctrine. We hear too much about doctrine in Pakistan these days, but I'm not going to, 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 to uh, travel into that, that territory. That is, that is not my domain. But Kissinger doctrine is well known. And what was this doctrine? First, he went on record to advise his president and the Western world as a whole that this blackmail of Western economies cannot be allowed to go unchallenged. He called it a blackmail of Western economies. And added ominously, that if necessary, we should be prepared to land our forces on the oil producing lands of Arabia. That vision somehow came true after Saddam Hussein invaded and occupied Kuwait. Because then Saudi Arabia itself allowed the American and Allied forces to land on Saudi on Saudi soil, and what happened during World War and during Gulf War One is well known to you. Kissinger came to the conclusion that Arabs would become a menace to Israel if they were allowed to coalesce if they were allowed to become united. So his, his strategy was that they should be picked up one by one. The first country that was picked up was Egypt. The most populous, the most powerful country in the Arab world. You are all familiar with, with the uh, with the accord that was reached between President Sadat and the Israelis, they came to the Camp David Accord, under which Egypt formally recognized Israel and entered into diplomatic relations with the Jewish state. 
and that was virtually the beginning of the end for the Palestinian rights. Because in, after losing Egypt, which under Gamar al Nasser had been in the forefront of advocating and championing Palestinian rights, the Palestinians virtually become orphans. They became orphans. And they have been orphans ever since. I don't have to remind you about the, the suffocating regime that Egypt had imposed over Gaza. The Gazans had previously the freedom of exiting from their, from their chicken coop. I call it the chicken coop, the, the largest open air prison in the world through Egypt. That freedom has been blocked since Pres President Sisi came to power. No more, no more exit for the Palestinians, no more free exit for the Palestinians uh, <coughs> through Rafah, the border with Egypt. So Palestinians have been the most unfortunate victims of, of this turmoil in the Arab world. <coughs> the Arab leaders have been rendered ineffective because of the success of Kissinger doctrine. It has been a remarkable success as far as Western policies are concerned. They have completely neutralized the Arab leadership as far as standing up for the rights of the Palestinians is concerned. But there have been occasional flare-ups. One flare-up was when Saddam Hussein invaded and occupied Kuwait. But another unexpected development had taken place before that, and that was the Iranian Revolution. Because the Iranian Revolution had never been scripted in what the Western political geography had laid down for the area. They had never envisioned that Shah of Iran, who was regarded as the the most loyal of Western friends in the Middle East would be overthrown and would be replaced by, by a regime which was poles apart from the philosophy of, of, of Shah Iran. After that, Saddam Hussein was prompted to, to invade Iran. That's another story what I call the, 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 the most stupid war in the annals of our modern history. That went on for eight long years and drained the resources and manpower of both Iran and Iraq. But then Iraq once again fell victim to, to Western political engineering. And that is when in 2003, Iraq was invaded on a lie. What was the excuse that Saddam Hussein was nearing, nearing the completion of an arsenal which could pose deadly threat to Western civilization? What did Tony Blair claim? Tony Blair claimed that Saddam Hussein was only days away from manufacturing missiles which could hit Britain. So Iraq was invaded on a line. There were demonstrations throughout the free world before the American invasion of Iraq. Do you know that the largest demonstration was held where? Where was it held? It was held in Rome where five million people participated in one demonstration against the war. I was reading somewhere that overall, throughout the world, 36 million people took part in the various processions and assemblies that were organized to protest the Bush plan to invade Iraq. 
but Iraq was nevertheless invaded with active help from some of the friends of of the West in amongst the Arab leaders. I don't have to name them. You know all about it. What I'm trying to, to, to make out is that the Western plan of keeping Arab leadership under their control has been very largely successful. Where it was not un what is not successful, you are seeing the fallout of that. And that brings me to the ongoing Syrian crisis. Six years ago, I, will, I happened to be in Delhi, and they invited me for two lectures at Jamia Millia, the famous Jamia Millia. One lecture was devoted entirely to the Syrian crisis. At the end of which, there were so many questions from the faculty and the students. And I said as a footnote, I said, look, my friends, this is a crisis which is ongoing. And let me tell you that if you invited me five years hence, the crisis would still be on. This was six years ago. Syria is, is uh, a quiet mind. Because those who engineered the Syrian crisis had no idea of what they were walking into. Syria is a hotspot of ethnic communities. Iraq was ruled over by a Sunni minority in a country where the majority population happened to be Shia. Syria, since the 1971 uh, takeover of power by Bash uh, by uh, by Hafez al Assad has been ruled by a minority. It has been ruled by a single family, in fact, which belongs to the Alawite minority. And Alawites totaled only 1.5 million in a to total population of 24 million in Syria. So some people thought they could easily overthrow the Alawites ruling over Syria. They helped the rebels who had stood up genuinely for their rights in March 2011. At the peak of Arab Spring. Arab Spring, ladies and gentlemen, has been an aberration in the script which was written for the Arab world a hundred years ago. As they had not envisioned the Iranian Revolution, the Arab Spring had never been envisaged not by the most well-informed and most well-educated pundits in the Western world. It was, not, it was not scripted at all because democracy and democratic rights for the Arab people has only been paid lip service. It was never meant to be implemented because had democratic rights for the Arab people being implemented, then there was no place for the rulers who had been ruling over them in these countries. The result of the Syrian crisis, cutting a very long story short, is that more than half a million people have been killed. More than three million people have been injured. Half of the total population of Syria has been rendered refugee. Half of them in their own country, the other half splintered all over the world, mostly, mostly in the West, which, as some of my diplomatic colleagues present here would know well, has become a problem for the Western countries themselves. This is a crisis which is not going to an end anywhere to anywhere soon. Because this is literally, literally 
a broth which has too many cocks. And each of the cocks would like to have the broth made their own way. I do not have any pretensions to predict what would be the outcome of, of the Syrian imbroglio. I don't think there is anyone in the entire community of pundits all over the world who could say with any amount of, of confidence and precision how the Syrian crisis is going to play itself out in the end. We may have to live with the consequences, with the ramifications, with the fallout of this crisis for as long as our imagination may travel. But Syria is going to decide ultimately how the chips are going to fall in the Arab world. As an optimist, I would only hope that at the end of it, the Arab people would gain some of the freedoms which are taken for granted in the Western world, in most of the democratic world. Freedoms which are taken for granted by us in Pakistan. That is where I would like to end this discourse and throw myself open to all, all sorts of questions, whichever, whatever you may like to, to pose to me, I would not be able to answer one question. Would you give me a card? Rest of the questions you are, you are most welcome to, to pose to me. You, you can pick my limited brains as, as much as you want. Thank you very much. Thank you. 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 They make up 15% of the, of the Turkish population. There are Kurds in Syria, Kurds in Iraq, in Russia, and also in Iran, five countries. But what a, what a misfortune. Wherever they live, none of the ruling powers is prepared to grant them independence and allow the sta uh, state of Kurdistan to, to be born. Kurds often, I have many friends amongst the Kurds, and they often cite the example of Israel, reminding me, or rather <laughs> telling me, look how easy it was for the Jews to create their own state on a land which did not belong to them. And then the next question comes up is, why can't we have our own state over the lands where we have been living for millennium? And you cannot deny the historical fact that girls have been where they are for centuries. And they have produced illustrious sons like Salahuddin Ayyubi. Saddam Hussein used to flaunt himself, his credentials, as a modern day Salahuddin Ayyubi because Salahuddin was born in, in uh, Tikrit, where Saddam was, was also born. Finessing over the fact that Salahuddin was a Kurd, whereas Saddam was an Arab. <coughs> But they will never have their state. I can tell you from, on the basis of my own experience, and I, I have interacted on this question with the Iraqis as well as with the, with the, with the Turks. 
Turks in particular, where, where the largest concentration of Kurds is, they told me point blank, said Ambassador, forget about it. We will never allow a Kurdistan to come into being because that Kurdistan will be another Israel. That would be another dagger in our house. And they were not wrong because it started right after the end of World War I, uh, of uh, Gulf War I, when Britain and United States together imposed a, an aerial embargo over Iraq. It had not been mandated by United Nations. You cannot show me one, one UN resolution saying that Iraq will not have uh, access or outlet area. They imposed, and then they started pampering northern Iraq where the Kurds are located. I have friends amongst the American diplomats and some of them used to travel regularly, regularly to the Kurdish areas of Iraq, pampering them. Israeli trainers were allowed into northern Iraq to train Peshmerga. Peshmerga has become an excellent fighting force largely because of the training imparted to them by, by the Israeli advisors and trainers. But then, despite all that, Kurdistan is not going to come into being as an independent state simply because none of these states where they are an ethnic community is in favor of letting an independent sovereign state of Kurdistan come into being. That's it. The second question about? Regarding these four states. Four states, oh yes, yes. yes. that, that is, that is, I, I call it Iran-Iraq war part two. Why? Why is Saudi Arabia so much against Qatar? Well, some of it has to do with their tribal rivalries. I told you that all these ruling families belong to Najat. Their roots are the same. So Qataris and the Saudis have had no love lost between them for a, for a very long time. But this particular crisis, has been generated because the Saudis did not want <coughs> offshore gas deposits to be exploited jointly with Iran. You know these offshore uh, gas deposits? Uh, we Pakistanis must be familiar with it because we, we entered into a deal with, with Qataris for the supply of liquefied natural gas. I will not, Aga Masood is here, he, he would know much better about that than, than I. My knowledge goes, but I won't go into that. But these are the richest natural gas deposits in the world after the Russian gas deposits. They are the second largest gas deposits in the world and Saudis did not want little Qatar to exploit these vast resources in cooperation with Iran. I, I don't but then it has to be done. If Israel is prepared to play its own part, they have to make it easy for Muslim states to recognize them. You must be aware of King Abdullah plan, which was presented uh, uh, more than 10 years ago, when King Abdullah was in power. Yeah. He said it very clearly, very categorically to Israel, we will recognize you, all of us amongst the Islamic State would recognize you if you are prepared to go back to the pre-1967 borders between uh, the Palestinians and Israel and to give 
the legitimate rights that belong to the Palestinians. Israel is not prepared to fulfill that, that part of the bargain, so why should we? That is the only card in our hand. Why should we play it without getting something in return? The moment Israel shows red growth of the American invasion of Iraq. I would be the last person to advocate on behalf of ISIS. They are a terrorist organization and terrorism has no place in the Muslim world. Terrorism has no place in Islam. We Muslims are Muslims because we believe we are we are ordained to submit in peace to the authority, to divine authority, and therefore terrorism has no place in Islam. Incidentally, I would challenge anyone amongst my audience to cite me one example where ISIS has attacked any of the Israeli interests. You cannot cite one example. All the victims of ISIS have been Muslims. They have killed Muslims mercilessly. What kind of Islam is this which gives you authority to slaughter your own people, your own brothers? They have not even spared children. So, ISIS has no place in any Muslim community. But then ISIS has come into being because of injustices which are so apparent, which have been done so blatantly to Muslims all over the world. Palestine is one example, Kashmir is another. We have so many. I can, I can cite a dozen examples where Muslim rights have been troubled. I have served in the Philippines where there is a Muslim because of our own weaknesses. It's very simple. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a matter of common sense. A thief would be tempted to break into your house if you leave your main door unbolted. You have to secure your own house, otherwise it will be temptation for a thief to break in. Going to the last part of your question, sir. Uh, President Trump has been saying so many things regularly. Don't take it seriously that Americans are about to withdraw from, from Afghanistan. Americans do not have the legacy of leaving a place. This is Syria, not Afghanistan. Syria. 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 Because, because they are not, they are not uh, involved on the ground, except for a very, very small contingent. But Americans do not have, as I said, a legacy of leaving any place occupied by them. They are still sitting in Germany more than 70 years after the end of World War II. They are still occupying bases in Japan <coughs> more than 70 years after the end of World War II. So it's, it is not in their DNA to leave a country easily once they have occupied or, or they have <coughs> made a, a military presence there. Since uh, uh, it pulled out uh, uh, on paper from Gaza, uh, all, all the Israeli settlements uh, in Gaza were vacated, but ever since then, that territory has been under an economic blockade. And Israel has, uh, has the facility to launch military action against Gaza at will. You, you have seen, they were, it bombarded the hell out of Gaza in 2007 and then again uh, three, four years later. Why? One, because there are only murmurs of protest in the Arab world. And two, Israel has the assurance 
that whatever it may do, the international community will not be able to move a finger against it. There is the U.S. veto to shield Israel against any accountability, against any accountability. That's why I said that Palestinians are the hapless victims of all this political geography arranged for the Arab world. It will go on like that. Because Israel has been 